again, thank you for, for joining us today. So um, healthy buildings and indoor air quality, um, something that uh, many of us didn't talk about in the past, but, but certainly has become top of mind today. Uh, so I want to start off by talking about our current environment. Um, what I like to, uh, to say is um, we're probably all dealing with some level of COVID fatigue. I think we expected this to be over months ago. Um, for many of us, certainly here in Texas, case rates have gotten much lower. Um, we do have a sense that, that you know, from an optimism standpoint, uh, we're getting back towards normal. Um, what is the new normal? That's going to be the thing we've got to understand. So again, vaccine announcements, we have optimism there. Um, you know, there's been some distribution challenges, but a lot of that has now been solved. Uh, the market is continuing to move upward. We're seeing improvements in employment. Um, but we do see the, the need to be better prepared for this in the future. And that's changing the way we look at buildings and changing what we do. Um, really, the bottom line here is what we've seen is that the customers are wanting to adapt and innovate uh, and really improve their facilities and improve the environments um, that the occupants, whether it be students or teachers or customers, uh, enter into. When we talk specifically about education, um, what we've learned is we are seeing a, a, an impact from remote learning. Uh, certain things need to happen in person to have the same impact. Um, Got many people on this call that are, are likely college students and, and are really looking at, you know, where do you get the best results? Um, certainly, we've gotten good at learning remotely, um, but certain things that we do are going to be better in person. To do things in person, we need to get back inside of buildings. Um, and so that's how we look at what actions do we take to get back into those buildings and, and have the confidence of doing that safely. Um, for train, what that's led to is a real focus around uh, an internal group we call uh, the Center for Healthy and Efficient Spaces. Uh, so we brought together a group of experts, both internally and externally, uh, to really focus on how to develop solutions for improved indoor environments, uh, what we call indoor environmental quality, IEQ. Um, however, for us as a company, we don't want to to the best of our abilities, compromise energy efficiency as we look at improving indoor environments. We've also made commitments as a company to reducing our carbon footprint, uh, what we call our gigaton challenge. And if you uh, move too far one direction, you can impact energy use uh, as you improve health of a building. We've seen ways to use technology to address that. Um, how are we doing that? Through innovation uh, and strategic partnerships, how are we ensuring we're aligning with the market? Well, we're collaborating with external advisory council, uh, with academia, and then we're helping to drive policy and standards uh, at the national and even the international level. Uh, whether you're talking about ASHRAE, you're talking about the US Department of Energy and EPA, uh, these are all groups that TRAIN works with. Um, so diving a little deeper in that, and then I'll move past it, but this is what it looks like. So we have this external council uh, members from, you know, international Queensland University, you know, uh, Lydia is very well known in the IEQ space, you know, Harvard, um, you have Penn State, uh, all these different individuals helping us to ensure alignment and a unified approach uh, on delivering value tied to IEQ. Uh, internal commitments, again, showing, you know, what's our focus. So we actually created this Center for Energy and Efficiency efficiency and sustainability back in 2010. This is not something that's new for train because of the pandemic. Certainly it's getting more focused now due to that in the past year. Uh, however, it's something we've had in place and of course we've just simply ramped that up. Um, again, we don't want to, to uh, compromise on our commitments and targets and you know our gigaton commitment of removing a gigaton of greenhouse gases uh, from either what we do or how we assist our customers has been a commitment we've had in place. We're going to stick with that even as we improve indoor environments. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, train well sphere. 
Um, sorry, got a little mess up here. Let's see if this goes back right. There we go. Um, so, so when we talk about WellSphere, uh, what is WellSphere? So, Train WellSphere is our platform for um, applying a holistic approach to building wellness. Uh, it, it's our way of looking at the four different elements of indoor environmental quality. So most of us are hearing about IAQ, indoor air quality, and that's here on the, on the bottom right. When we talk about IEQ, we want to look at a way to balance all of these different things. I'll give some really quick examples and then move on. Um, as we looked at improving indoor air quality, some of the early guidance had us bringing in considerably more outside air than, than we were designed to bring into a building. What that can lead to is it can impact our thermal comfort. We may not be able to heat or cool a building enough if we overventilate outside of design. So in an effort to improve indoor air quality, we could compromise thermal comfort. Another example, there's been a lot of utilization of portable in-room air cleaning devices, uh, things like an in-room HEPA um, or even other devices that are looked at. Those devices can vary in, in how much noise pollution they create. If you have, for instance, an in-room HEPA filter that, could, that is loud and you have it turned on high and it interferes with the ability to teach in a classroom, what we'll find is someone may go and unplug it. If you're unplugging an indoor air quality device because of acoustics, you're not improving indoor air quality. So for us to be able to deliver on a healthier space, you really need to look at all these different levels of indoor environments together. Talk about how we do that. Uh, as engineers, we wanna look at a systematic framework for how we approach indoor environments. Um, when we talk about health, for those on this call, but most people when you say health tend to think of your own health. You think of yourself as a person. Um, if I'm become more healthy or a person's looking to become more healthy, we have options of how we approach that. But if we're sick, what do we traditionally do? Traditionally, if we're sick, the first thing we do is we would go to a doctor. And what's that doctor going to do? They're going to do a checkup. They're going to look at our blood pressure. They're going to look at our temperature. Uh, they might do blood work. They may do other things to, to really evaluate what's going on with us. The next step they're going to do is potentially prescribe some actions to, uh, to address our health challenges. And then we may even get advice on how to stay healthier long term, change your diet, work out more often, et cetera. When we look at our systemic, systematic framework for managing IEQ, we take a similar approach with the three step framework for a building. The first thing that we recommend doing is do an assessment of the building. Again, that's like going to the doctor. Let's look at the patient. Let's understand what needs to be addressed before we start making recommendations uh, on how we're going to improve that environment. The next step, of course, is those recommendations. So how are we going to mitigate risk, improve the health of a building, mitigate the risk of spread of, of really any contaminant, whether we're talking about the pandemic or something else that might come in the future? And then that third step is, how are we going to manage that long term? Are we going to use technology for ongoing optimiz optimization, for instance? Um, are we going to train the staff on, on what they need to do for changing of filters, for schedules, et cetera? It can be a layered approach on how you manage, but we don't want to just make a building safer, healthier for a moment in time. We want to do that in a continuous fashion. And for customers that choose to go through that path with train, uh, we do have the ability to communicate their actions through air quality awards. Uh, so this is something we brought to market. Customers asked about it early on in the pandemic because they wanted a way to show that they've taken action. Uh, train brand is, is generally known in the market um, and it's a way to communicate that you've taken actions. Now, we also understand um, that you may look for third party communication. So things like well buildings, fit well, USGBC lead ratings or other things that train can help. All right, so I'm gonna move in next section here. I don't see any questions yet uh, around science and solutions uh, that train uh, brings to market. So again, 
kind of centering everyone. Our approach is about focusing on um, the customer's goals, understanding what technologies will work for that customer, understanding how to get funding uh, to, to improve their environments, uh, looking at long-term sustainability and resiliency goals, uh, and then aligning our leadership with the leadership of our clients uh, to improve credibility of actions. When we look specifically at higher ed, uh, there's a lot of different things that can be done. Uh, this graphic here essentially shows the, the three steps together. So the first step here is the assessment. Again, here we're shown the indoor air quality assessment where we would assess the building. Coming out of that is gonna be recommendations for potentially HVAC upgrades, improving filtration and ventilation. Good look at air cleaning technologies. I'll go into those in a little bit of detail shortly. Um, but what we've tested are four different technologies, dry hydrogen, uh, photocatalytic oxidation, bipolar ionization, and UV lighting, uh, different levels of acceptance for each technology. Uh, we do have a technology that focuses on surface cleaning, uh, which can limit the interventions uh, from a staffing standpoint for a customer in, in, for instance, higher ed, looking at how we're going to change over large classrooms, going in with foggers and, and surface cleaning, um, is not necessarily the most productive way to, to approach uh, cleaner surfaces. And then as you've taken those mitigation steps, how are you gonna monitor that long-term? So visualizing uh, a healthier space using technology. Summarizing all of that, our approach again is to take that three-step approach, set the site, mitigate the, the risk, and then manage it long-term. So that leads me into a, a deeper dive into each of these four steps or pillars of indoor air quality improvement. So first step we recommend is the air quality assessment. What is the train indoor air quality assessment? This is a fact-based data-driven analysis of the building's indoor air quality. Uh, we've updated this to align with the latest CDC guidelines for HVAC. Uh, CDC does have references to ASHRAE recommendations as well. We use this information to, to recommend ways to improve indoor air quality. And while we're on site, we'll also look at and highlight opportunities for future upgrades. What's very surprising, I guess maybe I shouldn't say surprising, most may not realize how few in the industry are even up to date on the latest guidelines from CDC, ASHRAE, World Health. Why? Because it's consistently changing. Uh, very recently, the guidance around surface cleaning protocols has essentially been walked back uh, by CDC, yet we still see a tremendous number of customers out there focusing their dollars and time on surface cleaning when that appears to not be a, a traditional or a, a primary transmission route for COVID-19. So again, we're here to provide the latest guidelines, the latest up-to-date research. And what do we want to do with our customers? Well, we want to understand how the recommendations that we make um, can benefit not just a healthier space, but we're also going to have to justify our actions financially in many instances. So, you know, let's not just talk about doing it because it's the right. But what if we can actually show a financial reason to take these actions? What we're showing here in an example is what is the benefit of having kids having having students um, back in dorm rooms confident that they can be back in school. This was a big challenge for larger universities, really any university that had on campus living uh, that they lost revenues and 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 lost the ability to have that uh, that on campus community uh, in the past school year. We want to help to get that back. We can put that together look at that information and actually help a customer create a pro forma. So what's the value of taking these actions to improve an indoor environment? So not only are you doing something that's good for your, your students, good for your university, good for the environment, you can also be doing something that's good for your balance statement. So if there was one message that the train would bring to this, we look at this opportunity as not a way to spend on IEQ, but how can we invest in IEQ? Let's do things that can help us address public pressure. Uh, let's improve attendance through in improved indoor environment for our students and staff. 
Uh, let's use our latest learnings to improve energy efficiency and reduce energy bills with the actions we take. And of course, where we can, let's address deferred maintenance and that aging infrastructure. So as we take that approach through an assessment, collaboratively working with our customer to come up with these recommendations, the output of that will be an actual assessment, pictures, site visits, and recommendations for actions a customer can take that are going to align with their goals um, for an improved environment. All right, so now we're talking about what the doctor tells you. Let's talk about the medicine. What's the, the mitigation steps that are options out there for a customer? As we look at mitigation, uh, there are four key pillars of, of IAQ uh, that TRAIN looks at. Uh, the first two relate pretty close to each other, dilute and exhaust. So again, when we're talking about dilution, we're talking about bringing in more outside air uh, to dilute those indoor contaminants. Um, these are recommendations that came from ASHRAE early on pandemic, we wanted to disable domain control ventilation, raise outside air damper set points, um, operate mixed air units as 100% outside air where we can, have your systems running 24-7, um, purge sequences for pre-occupancy, things like that. Well, this made building safer. At the height of the pandemic, these were very strong, uh, very intelligent actions to take. However, there's an energy impact to those things. So as we look at moving past the pandemic, uh, what are going to be the right things that we do in a balanced approach here? When we talk about contain, uh, what we're talking about here really is maintaining our relative humidity range in that ideal 40 to 60 percent. Majority of buildings other than healthcare traditionally focus on humidity only as a way to prevent mold in their buildings. Uh, we don't want to get above 60% relative humidity or we can deal with mold. Um, so traditionally, outside of healthcare settings, we don't see uh, the low side humidity focused on very often. What does that lead to? Well, we all know that that contributes to flu season. What is flu season? In the wintertime, when it gets cold, relative humidity rates drop. When you start seeing humidity drop below 40 30%, when you start feeling static electricity on your clothes when you walk into a building, that means you've got low humidity rates. And what we know is that can lead to viruses uh, aerosolizing and thereby transmitting much more easily through the air. So again, we saw spikes during this pandemic and we see spikes every year during flu season when relative humidity drops down. What's important for us to understand, if we're going to take an action like bringing in more outside air, uh, which was one of the first legs here, um, is that going to then impact our in indoor humidity range such that it makes it, you know, it's diminishing return. So, again, as we look at this from a holistic fashion, we want to be cognizant of overventilating in the wintertime or even the summertime can impact humidity levels and, and have a, a diminishing return. Uh, the next pillar here is around cleaning the air. So, a lot of uh, discussions around how do we clean the air if we're not adding ventilation, if we're not adding a humidifier, if we're not increasing exhaust, uh, we have the options of cleaning the air. Uh, early in the pandemic, recommendations around this was focused primarily on the utilization of MERV-13 filtration, uh, in-room HEPA filters, utilization of UVGI, uh, and every one of those technologies train absolutely supports. Now, what you see here is all these different technologies that TRAIN has focused on and, and actually tested against an airborne pathogen, surface-borne pathogen, et cetera, to help guide our customers towards options. Um, at times, more options than, than are in the standard guidance. An example of where you might see these different technologies utilized. So, you know, where we can, we certainly want to maximize filtration, get to that MERV-13 or equivalent. Um, if you've got a space that's got good air circulation through it, um, we look at things like bipolar ionization as a possible technology to implement. If you've got a large area that has a, a lot of air that needs to be clean, uh, things like UVGI can do really well because that does a, that technology does a great job of ensuring that the air coming out of the air handler is clean. Uh, we have a new technology that, that we brought to market called dry hydrogen peroxide. 
Uh, what we found in testing is that technology performs very well, not just on airborne pathogens, but also surface pathogens. Knowing that, that COVID-19 is not primarily spread on surfaces, um, that may or may not fit budgets for customers. So we, we make sure though, and recommend that for high occupancy or critical spaces, uh, nurses offices, you know, again, conference rooms, places where we know that spread is likely to occur. Uh, why not look at a technology that can clean air and surfaces? Because certainly other things do spread via surface. And the last piece here is the ability for a customer to actually communicate their action. You know, here we're pointing to a sticker on the door. Uh, if a customer goes through this process, either with us, through well buildings, whomever, um, you can earn your, your uh, air quality award from train or even a, a well health safety rating as an example. All right, I do see a question. So I, I'm set up to take questions uh, when we have these little uh, black areas here, just to make sure I'm, I stay on with people. Uh, looks like there's a question around a senior project with thesis, Arizona State. She had got to design a meditation room. Have you given your clients any information about other aspects like indoor plants that act like filters, such as snake plants, color schemes and furniture? Um, specific to a snake plant, uh, that is not something that we have looked at specifically, uh, but I can tell you we are absolutely looking at a lot of different ways to impact, impact indoor environments. Um, what makes an impact, uh, you know, low VOC emitting materials, uh, sealing materials, for instance, um, can have an impact. Um, there's more things that impact the in indoor environment than a lot of us are aware. Um, so those, those things are being looked at pretty consistently. All right, so we'll keep moving here. Um, back to air cleaning. So the first piece is filters. So when we talk about this pathogen, you're talking about a pathogen that is about 0.1 micron. So it's you're, you're talking or, or smaller, you're talking viruses down in this ultra fine range. Um, so you'll hear a lot of discussions around how these filters don't necessarily work well in picking up viruses, even HEPAs can struggle. I would not agree with that statement. I do believe filters can work well, and I do believe HEPAs uh, play a very strong role. Part of the reason for that is if your humidity levels have not dropped too low, uh, those viruses tend to still be in larger droplets such that even though the virus itself may be down here, the actual particle you catch might be in a range that is, that is larger. This is the reason that ASHRAE recommended MERV 13 or better. And people ask, is MERV 15 better than MERV 13? You know, this, there's this whole range. Again, this is a chart here, you know, kind of typical diameter that we would see uh, before a virus becomes a full aerosol. You can see as you get to MERV 13, you might pick up 50% of it. MERV 14, you're picking up 70%, 80%, 90% as you get to MERV 16. Uh, so we, we do see value in getting up to at least MERV 13 and in testing that TRAIN did uh, essentially validated a lot of that guidance that came from ASHRAE. So let's talk about other guidance that's been provided to date by ASHRAE and CDC. Uh, the next level of guidance here is around utilization of ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, otherwise known as UVGI. So what is UVGI? Uh, UVGI is using a short wavelength ultraviolet light to inactivate a microorganism by destroying its, its nu nucleic acid structure and destroying the RNA. Um, we know exactly the, the wavelength we want to focus on here. Uh, this can be up to 99.9% .9 effective. The reason there's an up to, and I'll hit it in a second, it really matters how you dose this, and that's a place we still see the market making mistakes. Um, there can be exposure risks um, at the right intensity. This can actually burn someone's skin or eyes, so you need to take um, safety precautions when utilizing this technology. Um, and you've got to look at what it can do to materials. So um, there are those looking at UVGI during unoccupied times in spaces. And that can actually lead to creating organic materials, can lead to VOC generation, because as it shines on something, that can cause off-gassing. So uh, we generally don't recommend UVGI into a space unless it's for upper room. 
There's also a new technology called FAR UV that's become more prominent due to the pandemic. Uh, this is at a different wavelength, 222 nanometers. Uh, early tests indicate that it is effective at inactivating uh, certain microorganisms. Um, but for today, there's still uh, some questions around exposure risks. Um, we have not yet seen those questions answered. Um, for that reason, it's not something that we're traditionally bringing to, uh, to customers through our channel. Not saying that if a customer wanted it, we wouldn't necessarily provide it, uh, but it has not been a focus from train. So back to how does UV work uh, and why is there um, kind of this difference? For those on the call that may have experience in HVAC, you might be familiar with UV lights for coil cleaning. What we would traditionally see in a coil cleaning application might be a UV dose in the 150 to 250 um, microjoules, which is going to be, you know, not near as powerful as ASHRAE now recommends. Why was the dose so much less then, and why are we asking for more now? The way that UV works, it's a function of irradiance, so the amount of light energy we're using times time. If we're trying to keep a coil clean, your time is infinite because you're constantly shining on it and we're looking at keeping that surface clean. And so you don't need near as much power. Uh, when you look at what ASHRAE has recommended for what we would call on the fly disinfection, the recommendation is where possible, achieve 1500 microjoules of, of intensity. So you're talking about what could be 10 times more lighting energy than you traditionally expect. So what does that look like? That can be much more intense from a lighting standpoint. Um, and again, we see customers at times think that UV light is some binary thing. I have it or I don't. As you can see in this chart, this is for on the fly kill rates. And if you're surface cleaning at you know, 100 to 150, a similar airborne virus like the flu, you might only be eliminating 11 to 16% with traditional UV light. You've got to jump up to these ranges to really get strong uh, efficacy. So again, there's options for things like surface cleaning. Um, that's been more traditional. Now we're looking at more intense lighting for on the fly in duct. When we look, when we as train look at uh, in room, certainly you can do surface disinfection. As I mentioned earlier, just be cognizant of what surfaces are getting this light shined on them uh, because it can impact those surfaces for a period of time. And this can only be done in an unoccupied space. Uh, if you want to have UV light in a space that's occupied, um, the recommendation there is to use upper room UV. It is actually made to shine on the ceiling and it picks up air as that air uh, disperses to the ceiling. Uh, so that's a way to do this in, a, in, an, in an occupied zone. Quick summary on UV. So it's well established. Uh, it's got demonstrated effectiveness against many pathogens. This was recommended by ASHRAE in the reopening guide, uh, even as recent as February of this year. Uh, it's in the CDC guidelines towards the end of February. Uh, we know how to specify 254 nanometer UVGI's per nominal wavelength. Uh, we can apply it in airstreams. Uh, can use it on coil surfaces, um, but again, uh, precaution should be taken to make sure that you focus on the safety side. If you're putting it in an air handler, make sure you have a door switch. All right, Get through all the technologies real quick, and then I'll take questions on technologies as appropriate. Uh, next up, bipolar ionization. So what is bipolar ionization? Bipolar ionization um, bipolar ionizers are induct or in air unit devices that will create a plasma field to charge molecules, which we would call ions. So plasma is one of four states of matter, the other three being solids, liquids, and gases. And so what this consists of is taking a gas and creating ions um, through putting it through a high voltage plasma field. Once that is done, these ions can attach to small airborne particles, um, causing some particles to be negatively charged and others to be positively charged. As that happens, uh, that leads to what we would call agglomeration, uh, resulting in uh, larger surfaces, which makes them easier to capture in a filter. Um, as air passes over this device, ions are created. 
Ions from the device can reduce contaminants from the air that passes through the plasma field. Um, from a life expectancy standpoint, most ions have a short half-life. So they're gonna live for about 60 seconds, which does mean that it is possible to have ions in the occupied zone. So this is a technology that we found uh, would actually be able to uh, reduce airborne pathogen spread if applied properly. Now we did find a conflicting claim to what some manufacturers have stated, um, which is still unresolved. I will leave it there. Um, but despite conflicting claims in the market, our third party testing did not show a significant impact on surfaces or VOCs within an occupied space. There is testing out there that shows different. Overview of the systems. So the older traditional systems um, uh, were called Corona discharge. They have tubes. You're looking at something where you're going to actually have to replace tubes on some maintenance schedule. Could be yearly, could be every couple of years. Um, those systems traditionally created ozone uh, to some level. Now, doesn't mean that they won't meet UL listings and they're not acceptable to be utilized, but historically, the uh, corona discharge was more likely to, to create ozone. There was a, new, a newer design that came out uh, recently, and when I say recently, it's, it's been years, but it's a, a newer design called needlepoint bipolar ionization. That is a needle of carbon fiber, titanium, silver, gold, stainless steel, essentially a, a patented blend that will reduce the voltage creation uh, to prevent or reduce ozone generation, yet still create ions. So many of these needlepoint devices now carry a UL certification called 2998, uh, which is considered to be ozone free. You To pass that certification, you have to demonstrate that you produce less than five parts per billion, which is a very, very trace amount of ozone. Quick summary on bipolar. Uh, it's been shown to effectively inactivate many airborne viruses uh, within the airstream and inside the space. When applied properly, it introduces ions directly to the space to provide active reaction into the zone. This can potentially be a lower overall cost than competing technologies. Uh, a lot of times you don't need additional sections in the equipment, uh, low power requirements, negligible pressure drops, um, Needlepoint technology also can be popular because it does not require the annual tube replacements. Some cautionary comments, some manufacturers still use the older technology, which may create ozone. So if you're looking at ozone, it is strongly recommended that you require at minimum UL867 certification for ozone, which is less than 50 parts per billion. Um, that is actually a requirement from the CDC. Um, there is a preference where possible to carry the UL2998 certification, which is much more stringent. We're going from 50 parts per billion to five, a 90% reduction in ozone generation. Um, and that is a requirement from the latest ASHRAE 62.1 2019 standard update. I want to make some other comments about this recommendation and where things have gone. So this, this technology was actually recommended in the reopening guide by the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force um, released on July 15th of 2020. The updated building readiness guide from February of this year has removed this recommendation. In addition, the updated reopening guide for schools and universities updated October 7th of 2020 has also removed this recommendation. Um, there's being some more studies that are occurring on bipolar um, and I would say the market is, is undecided uh, on where this will move. Uh, for train, our approach is to be very transparent, share what we know, uh, share what's being said, and let our customers make an intelligent decision. Moving on, next te technology we'll talk about is dry hydrogen peroxide. So dry hydrogen peroxide is a technology that was created by a company named Synexis. Um, they manufacture this technology, they own patents on it, um, and it's a technology that can be put into a space very quickly, very easily, uh, that will essentially make a um, gaseous form of hydrogen peroxide in the air. You can see this device actually mounted on the wall in a classroom right here. It's a visible solution, so it can help customers gain some confidence about what's going on. How does this work? So we're taking uh, ambient water and oxygen 
uh, out of the air, and we're converting that into a hydrogen peroxide mo molecule. Uh, vapor, it's, it's uh, creating that through that, this process. Uh, this is much less concentration than you might see from things like vaporized hydrogen peroxide, which is a different technology. Traditionally, the, com the uh, concentration that we will see in a space can be anywhere from 5 to 25 parts per billion, and the OSHA limits are 1,000 parts per billion. So this is considerably under the OSHA limits um, for safety. Now, that can make it sound like, does this still work? Uh, just an example of, of even at 10 parts per billion, how many molecules are you talking about? In three quarters of an inch, basically the width of a penny, you'd have over 38,000 dry hydrogen molecules. If you're between two people at six feet, you're talking 3.6 million molecules in a straight line. It is still enough to be effective and our testing did show as much. Uh, we also have third party test data that's been done, uh, many different rounds of testing on this technology for a lot of different contaminants. Uh, so this is something that we're seeing again for high risk spaces because it does attack so many different things. Um, seeing use in, in hospitals go up, um, it's factual, it's factual and, and documented now that this technology is actually being used in the White House. So considerations for dry hydrogen, again, this has been shown to effectively in inactivate many viruses within the airstream and the space. This works by introducing a gas phase hydrogen peroxide molecule directly to the space to provide, to provide an active reaction in the zone. This means is the air that we're breathing between two people doesn't have to make its way back to an air handling unit uh, or to an in-room air cleaner to be treated. It can be treated immediately as it leaves um, uh, the contaminated individual's mouth. This technology can act actively treat air, surfaces, uh, impacts fung fungal load and VOCs. Um, if someone is interested with this, really requires a consultative approach when evaluating how this works. Um, again, this technology is more expensive um, it is something we want customers to understand what they're getting and make sure they're applying it in the right way and in the right places. This is not some silver bullet one size fits all. Um, again, um, that's where we look to a customer to, to help us understand potential space use. So, all of that can be pretty confusing. Lots of technologies to talk about. How did train come to a position where we felt like we could recommend any technology? And how do we demystify this for our customers? For that reason, uh, this past fall, Train actually went to a third party lab to actually com compare these technologies and efficacy against each other. Uh, we did this with technologies that could be installed in duct, and we looked at technologies that could be located in the room. We tested these technologies for viral reduction capability, both on aerosols and on surfaces. We used a virus that is a, a harder challenge, uh, the MS2 virus. Um, as it, it is a, um, um, uh, an unencapsulated virus, so it is harder to deactivate. We looked at bacterial reduction. We looked at VOC reduction capability and or VOC generation. We looked for byproducts like ozone, ions, et cetera. And then we also looked at fine particles. We did this in a chamber uh, large enough to be occupied. That was one of the, the early challenges to a lot of the testing data on air cleaners related to chambers that were uh, not re not relative to actual field use. Uh, for that reason, when Train looked for who we would partner with for air cleaning, uh, we tried to find the largest chamber we could, we could, um, and that led to us going to a third party called LMS Labs and testing in a 1,007 cubic foot chamber. Again, if you're looking at a nine foot ceiling, you're talking about 120 square feet, not a large chamber, but large enough for a couple of people to actually be in the room. Closest thing uh, available at the time to real world conditions in a lab. And what did we find? Well, the good news we found is that with the baseline of MERV 13, which showed strong effectiveness for airborne pathogens, uh, most every one of these technologies could meet or exceed MERV 13 performance. Now, you might ask why we're showing on here a technology plus MERV 8. When we're looking at air cleaners, we're typically adding to existing filtration that's already in place. Uh, by code, any cooling coil that creates condensate is expected to have at minimum a MERV-8 filter upstream. 
So traditionally, you're going to be adding an air cleaning device to a MERV-8 filter, and the net result needs to meet or exceed MERV-13. And we were able to demonstrate that with these different technologies. Now, as our customers see all that, of course, there's this, well, what are you telling me I should do? Is it a UV light? Is it an ionizer? Is it dry hydrogen? Is it a MERV-13 filter? Is it a HEPA filter? What, what should I do? For this reason, TRAIN developed a IAQ cleaning technology decision tree. Allow us to work consultatively with our customer to really understand the type of building, where they may place the product, um, and then what are the really most important things for the customer? Are we focusing specifically on airborne pathogens only as we're focusing on the pandemic? Are we focusing long term on airborne and surfaces? Are, is uh, mold or fungal um, issues a challenge? Depends on your location. Do we want to look at VOC reductions, particulates? How important is energy, first price, maintenance? All these different metrics. And what this allows is for a customer to work with us to really make a few recommendations versus eight or nine. As best we can demystify this by space use and building type, we can help a customer efficiently come up with a solution. All right, so now we've made some recommendations. We've looked at what technologies we may use. Um, how are we now going to manage that? From the managed pillar, we can't take action on the things that we can't see. Uh, there's a big challenge today. People want to know if they're going into a safe facility or at least safer than it would have otherwise been. Historically, we would look at things like temperature, humidity, we might look at CO2, uh, and we might look at efficiency. Hopefully we're looking at efficiency. Um, now what we're learning through the pandemic is we're becoming more aware of things like volatile organic compounds, fine dust, ambient light, ambient noise. As we wanna see more in our control systems and, and visualization, it's leading to uh, essentially uh, development and innovation. What you can see here is an example of a dashboard where we're actually looking at the four pillars of indoor air quality. And then you can see on here actually tracking things like VOC concentration and really mapping in that data, CO2 concentration, all of these different things uh, to help a customer understand if they're providing a healthier space. Doing things like dashboard and visualization can also help us achieve things like health safety ratings uh, from groups like WELL. Uh, or even, again, trains um, air quality board. So with that, I know I took one question in the middle. Uh, I wanted to leave about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, so that is the end of our presentation uh, and ways that we could take next steps. So I'm going to put this here and, and maybe switch to Q&A. Um, I do see a question come in. So a uh, question about are there smaller versions of these things that can be done at home? Um, so, the answer there is, is yes, um, depending on which technology that you're, you're talking about. Um, again, for, for in-home solutions, uh, it is a more, um, uh, more flooded market, maybe is the really the fair term to use. There's, there's a lot of products out there, um, but the things that we know from a commercial side uh, still make those same recommendations. You know, if your system can handle an upgraded filter, Certainly recommend doing that. Um, if you're concerned of a high risk space, you could use something like um, a portable HEPA and place it in the room with multiple fan speeds. You can get those at Lowe's or Amazon or whomever. Uh, if you're specifically interested in an air cleaning technology, um, you know, for instance, bipolar ionization is, has been popular for in-home use. Um, of course, my recommendation would be ensure you have a UL listing on that device um, so you're not uh, breathing in dangerous ozone at levels that are higher than recommended. Um, so you can certainly do research and find that a lot of these things are available uh, for home use as well. Uh, next question was around, do you consult with, with small churches and theaters? Is the hydrogen peroxide technology affordable for them? Um, we have worked with both. Uh, I've actually talked to some very large theater chains that are exploring the technology uh, as a way to reduce the amount of surface cleaning that they're doing between showings. Um, for those on the, on the call, you hear, we're going to reduce surface cleaning. That makes it less safe. Um, let me share a little thing that we actually know now that we've done the science around this. Enhanced surface cleaning can actually increase VOCs. 
So when you walk into a space and it's, you know, it smells clean and you're breathing, you know, you're breathing in those cleaning fumes, that's not healthy either. So having all of that extra VOCs in the air because we're using a chlorine based or, or um, you know, vinegar based or other form of cleaner um, is not necessarily making that a safer space. So um, we do see interest in, again, higher occupancy spaces, spaces that would potentially have uh, a surface cleaning regimen uh, where this essentially removes the need for enhanced surface cleaning. Doesn't mean we don't clean surfaces at the end of the day. When we do that, there's no one in, in that space for a building that um, that is, you know, uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Or, or what have you on a schedule. You clean it at night, overnight, those cleaning agents will disperse through the air and you don't breathe it the next morning. Um, is the HP system silent? Uh, so hydrogen peroxide has a different couple of different options. There is a duct, uh, duct mounted option uh, that you would typically utilize on a system that's going to be 24 seven. And in that regard, you're not going to hear the device itself as it's the main air handling unit that's providing that out. Uh, when you're looking at something uh, portable, the one I showed you on the wall actually uh, can be loud when it's on its high setting. However, this, the speed of the fan does not impact the generation of the hydrogen peroxide into the space. And so it's going to disperse through a space. Um, so traditionally, we would only recommend having it on a high fan speed to improve the efficacy of the, in, the built in filters that are a part of the device. And then once you've got your space to an equilibrium, switch to low or medium. Um, these devices are actually used at my daughter's preschool. Um, imagine that. Um, and uh, the teachers will put it on low. Um, and it's once you're on low, it's it's hardly noticeable. It is still making sound, but it is much less than being on high. Uh, next question. Do you have any comments on particulates PM 10 PM 2.5 or PM 1.0? Some people feel that EPA limits are not stringent enough, although most studies focus on outdoor air. Um, are there any requirements for indoor air particulates? So, yes, focus on particulate matter has certainly increased. Uh, we are looking and hoping to find more alignment uh, regarding standards there. Um, you've got recommendations from USGBC, which is US Green Building Council, LEED. Uh, that are different than what well health safety ratings uh, and, and what well would say the level should be, which can be different than ASHRAE and can differ from um, uh, OSHA limits. Um, so there's work being done to get better alignment there and more agreement uh, towards what levels are, are optimal, uh, what levels are less optimal but still safe, and what levels become a true concern. Um, so a lot of work going on around that. Don't know that we'll have exact alignment this year. Um, would surprise me, uh, but it is something being worked on and, and trained is in those conversations. Uh, Susan asking how to arrange a consultation. Uh, so, Susan, you can certainly get my contact info uh, after this. This uh, Georgian can help with that, um, but a train account manager can certainly help uh, with uh, a site assessment. Uh, Want to share with others on the call that may have consultants that they already work with. Uh, we traditionally will do this uh, with a consultant if, a, if you have a consultant that you already would like to work with. And we can explain the program uh, to work collaboratively with the consultant on it. So it can be done in collaboration or it can be done just by training. Um, another question here, which if any of these technologies has been installed at the DSC building? Uh, Georgia and I don't actually know the answer to that as a, my apologies. Um, being national support, I, I don't know every installation that we have, um, but we may get into that one offline. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know, but uh, Guido, I will check on that and get back to you. Thanks for the question. And I think that's what I see in here now. Okay, well, Scott, we appreciate so very much 